we've been on an epic adventure exploring the Gulf Coast of Florida. Today we wrap it all up in Tarpon Springs. We're checking out the famous sponge docks in an area rich with Greek heritage. We hope you'll join us for the ride. We started out driving through the Everglades in our self-converted camper van and meandered up the coast, making our way to the Clearwater area. We've seen unspoiled beauty, amazing wildlife, and some quirky places. We visited state parks and small towns. And we've continued to get better at van life while trying to keep costs to a minimum. So here we are this morning at a Cracker Barrel parking lot. And we are right next door to a McDonald's. So I'm going to run across and get a couple sausage biscuits and a coffee that we're going to combine with our leftover eggs. Meanwhile, Audrey's in the van getting ready for the day. Breakfast delivery. Just in time. I'm hungry. All right, so this morning we're using up our resources. We're getting to the end of our food supply. We had some eggs left and that was about it. So we got the sandwiches from McDonald's and we're gonna supplement, add eggs to the sandwiches. Something different. Do you want mustard on yours? Sure. And look at that. Huh? Breakfast of improvised champions. <laughs> Before heading to Tarpon Springs, we restocked on some essentials. This morning our destination is the Tarpon Springs Sponge Docks. But we made a quick stop in the historic downtown first to see the old railroad depot from the 1900s and to see what else the town has to offer. After a quick look and a few pics, we headed over to the docks. We found some free parking just a few blocks away from the sponge docks. Ready to go see some sponges? It's day 13 of our trip up the Gulf side of Florida. We started in Everglades City and now we're here in Tarpon Springs at the Tarpon Springs sponge docks. This is supposed to be the sponge capital of the world. So in this episode, we're going to share with you scenes from this area, but also some of the highlights from the whole trip. Greek immigrants built the sponge industry here, transforming a small village on the Anquote River into the sponge capital of the world. The sponge industry became the community's most important industry. So there's lots of shops and restaurants to check out here, but if you follow along on our channel, you know we don't like to spend too much money. So we're just going to see the sights and keep moving on. That's the original sign up there. Yeah, that's, that's cool. A, that's 114 years old. Wow. 
In 1907, sponge buyers created the Sponge Exchange. A building with a courtyard was erected in which each sponger could store his catch while awaiting the auctions that took place twice a week. Today, visitors can browse neat little shops here selling sponges and other souvenirs. Unfortunately, in the late 1930s, a bacterial blight severely reduced the growth of sponges and destroyed the industry. By the 1950s, sponging as a profitable industry was nearly wiped out. However, in the 1980s, new sponge beds were found. Now Tarpon Springs is back to being a leader in the world's natural sponge market. Here's a sand dollar, but with inflation. It's a dollar 25. <laughs> You guys want to see my favorite store? Are you the free exhibit today? Only 25 cents. <laughs> Thanks to inflation, right? The Sponge Factory Museum seemed to be just a glorified shop. It said free exhibit, but we didn't see anything that looked like an exhibit. Maybe we missed something? Anyway, there are boat tours that leave from here. If we'd had more time, we might have considered booking a tour with the hopes of getting up close with dolphins. Maybe another time when we're back in the area. Tarpon Springs. We didn't spend a lot of time there, but we feel like we got a good fix for the area. What did you think about it? I thought it was pretty interesting. Uh, pretty touristy, but certainly interesting with the history. I'm not sure exactly how much sponging they do, if that's the right word for it <laughs> today, but still pretty neat. Um, a lot of different shops and restaurants. Pretty cool. I'd go back. Well, I prefer to visit more natural areas. I thought it was cool to walk around there as well. And I enjoyed seeing all the sponges and seashells and things that they had on display. So it's a neat little area with an interesting history and strong Greek influence. Nice, especially if you like Greek food. And I think it was a nice way to end off our trip before we head over to the East Coast and explore more over on that side. What do you think from this whole trip was some of your favorite highlights or places? Well, the sunsets for sure were spectacular. I uh, particularly enjoyed Times Square, Fort Myers Beach. Just uh, a lot of things going on, a lot of street performers, and a uh, band was playing. It just was a beautiful weather, made for a very nice evening. Steve mentioned Fort Myers Beach area. If you're into touristy areas and people watching and places where there's a lot of activity, a couple of the best places on the Gulf side are Fort Myers Beach and Clearwater Beach. They have a lot of activities in the evening, especially around sunset and street performers and just lots of things going on. Um, during the day, it's also pretty busy and those places tend to be a little more expensive for parking. My favorite areas are more natural where there's just a lot of um, nature and wildlife and pretty scenery. My favorite two spots were Lover's Key State Park and Honeymoon Island State Park. They were so gorgeous, wonderful water views, great nature, lots of seabirds, and then hiking trails too that we were able to check out. So I definitely recommend those spots. The nice thing with the state parks is how well they're preserved and the wildlife that you can see there. Some of the highlights for me, definitely finding the sand dollar out in the water on the sandbar. We saw lots of things, lots of shells, little critters and shells. Um, what else on the beach? Oh, the little sand, the sea urchin. Dolphins. Yes, lots and lots of dolphins on the Gulf side, especially compared to what we usually see on the East Coast. If we see dolphins on the East Coast, they're usually further out, so it was really fun to see them close up in so many spots that we went to. And uh, then when we hiked around on the trails, 
we saw the great horned owl, which was really cool. We saw a couple eagles, but we didn't get any footage of them, but that was really cool. It's the first time we've actually seen eagles in the wild in Florida. What other things do we see? We saw the ospreys catching fish. Can you remember other? I think that was about it that I can remember. Some of the shorebirds that I really liked seeing were the black skimmers and the royal terns, the least terns. I was hoping to see more um, like some spoonbills and things like that, but we really did see a lot of wildlife on this trip, especially at the state parks. So really special. We have lots of great places in Florida, all up and down the Gulf Coast. It's just so many incredible things to see and do. So as we travel, we really try to keep our costs down. One of the ways that we do that is through this camper van that makes it possible. We love being able to travel in the camper van. We've been building it out for about two years and we are just loving it. And after all that work, it's definitely paid off. It helps us get to a lot of places where larger things, larger vehicles couldn't fit. It's good gas mileage and it's just nice for kind of traveling wherever we want to go. If we don't like an area, we're not stuck to campgrounds or hotels and reservations. We can just leave an area if we don't like it or stay longer if we do. Um, having the camper van also comes with some challenges, that's for sure. Uh, one of the things is finding overnight parking. So in this whole series, we've tried to show where we park and some of the downsides of that, like the knock that we had on the door at one in the morning, one of the nights. Um, some of the nights are not always quiet and then others are. So it's kind of an ongoing thing. We're always researching where we stay, and trying to figure it out as we go along. So we've learned it's nice to play it safe as much as possible at those kind of places to avoid the uh, knock in the middle of the night like we had at the one location on Lido Key. That's not so fun in the middle of the night. Another challenge for sure as we travel is just making sure that we have enough power for everything. We try to be creative about how we do things. Um, instead of using our computers in the van a lot, we'll look for libraries. But uh, when we're not at the library and it's just kind of normal, day-to-day -day life. We have the solar panel in our EcoFlow Delta and you just kind of have to keep in mind how much power you have left and managing it, making sure you don't use too much. We have our challenge with keeping our food cold. As many of you know, we have been resistant to getting a 12-volt fridge because of the expense and also we don't like the space and kind of storage options they provide. So we're trying to make it with our dorm fridge that we really like, but it doesn't always run the best or we have some issues. We actually had our solar going the other day and running. we were running the fridge at the same time, only to come back to the van and realize that something wasn't running right with our unit, our power unit. So the input, the what do you call it, the solar input or whatever, wasn't doing what it should have been in the middle of the day. So we had to reset the power unit and then all of a sudden we were pulling in the higher number of watts again. So it's kind of something you have to stay on your toes and be mindful of. It's just one more thing. I guess when you have a house, there are similar chores, but it's a little more complicated in the van. Another challenge with traveling in the van is definitely weather and climate control. We don't have an AC unit in the van and we don't have a heater, a heater either other than a little electric one that we can use when we're plugged in somewhere. So in terms of travel in Florida, if you're doing van life or camping, our opinion is that pretty much around this time is the cutoff for exploring Florida in a van. It's the beginning of May and it's just starting to get hot again, the summer heat and humidity. So we've been trying to do as much as we can around Florida to avoid those temps. And I would say, you know, if you're going to visit Florida, the best time is the winter months. Probably starting, would you say, December is when it starts getting most comfortable? Yeah, usually the end of November. It depends, obviously, because yeah. it's not always the same. But typically, yeah, end of November, or early December through maybe end of April, typically a little into May. So we have had the perfect weather on this trip. We're really thankful. Our last trip up in central Florida had been rainy and cold. So this trip has been like a breath of fresh air. Amazing, amazing, amazing. So we hope you've enjoyed coming along with us, seeing all the amazing sights. If you haven't already, we really hope you'll be able to do some exploring in the great state of Florida. If you have any questions at all about places we've traveled or how we do van life, leave us a comment below. Also, let us know if you'd like us to cover anything in the future.
Thanks for watching, everyone. Again, drop us a comment below. Let us know you've been watching. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. And we will catch you on the next one. See ya. Coming up, we'll be working on some of the last items on our to-do list as we get close to our van build finish line. And we'll be heading up the East Coast to visit family, do some sightseeing, and escape the hot and humid summer weather conditions of Florida. We hope you'll tune in. See you next time.